monitoring to see when we show up on Facebook. There's usually a bit of a delay. Mm -hmm. And we are live. Welcome, mighty Blaze, mighty mystery fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I'm thrilled to be here today with Karen Dion, author of The Wicked Sister. Karen, welcome. Tell us about your book. Hi, everyone. This is so exciting to be here. The Wicked Sister actually publishes today. So, you know, if I seem to be floating, that's why. It's such an exciting moment when your book finally hits bookstores at last. So The Wicked Sister, it's psychological suspense, and it's set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, as my previous novel was. And The Wicked Sister tells the story of Rachel Cunningham, who grows up in this beautiful log cabin in the wilderness in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Just a totally over the top cabin. You know, it's, it's two stories. It has a copper roof, stained glass windows, uh, Tiffany lamps, Navajo blankets, Oriental rugs. It's been, it was a former hunting lodge and it's been in her family for generations. Her parents are wildlife biologists. And so she spends her days growing up um, trailing her mother in the woods. Her mother studies black bears. And Rachel fe feels such a strong connection to the natural world and particularly to black bears that even when she's an adult, she feels like she can talk to animals on kind of a deeper, almost a spiritual level. But the novel does not open with Rachel happily tramp trapsing the woods after her mother. Uh, it opens with Rachel in a mental hospital. And she's been there for 15 years because she believes that she's responsible for the terrible shooting accident that took her parents' lives when she was 11. Oh, oh my gosh. Wow. So wow. The story is basically like, you know, her trying to figure out what really happened and, you know, crawling back from that really dark place where, where the story begins. Oh, that is a dark place. Oh my gosh. Well, Karen, you have earned incredible praise for this. I have to share just a few. Um, Publishers Weekly gave it a starred review and said, Dion paints a haunting portrait of a family hurtling toward the tragic destiny they can foresee but are powerless to stop. Wow, congratulations on a starred review from Publishers Weekly. Karen Slaughter, the amazing Karen Slaughter, raves, the Wicked Sister is massively thrilling and altogether unput downable. I love that word. Dion is proving to be one of the finest suspense writers working today. Oh my God, amazing. I know. Um, yeah. <laughs> Liv Constantine <laughs> says, a chilling portrait of a psychopath that will shock and fascinate you. Dion is a master storyteller who has crafted a terrifying thriller that will haunt you long after the last page is read. Um, Wendy Walker says, Karen Dion is back with a dark, atmospheric, and chilling tale set in the deep woods of Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Beautifully written. The S Wicked Sister moves seamlessly between past and present. No small thing to do multiple sight lines. <laughs> Unraveling the truth between a family tragedy. Oh my gosh, I could go on and on because you have earned such incredible praise. Karen, tell us, what's the secret to writing a book that, that gets this kind of praise? What's your secrets? Well, The Marsh King's Daughter is actually, oh, excuse me, The Marsh King's Daughter, that's the book before The Wicked Sister, okay? Yes. So the two are, are similar. They're both set in the Upper Peninsula. The Marsh King's Daughter was my fourth published novel, but it's what we call in the industry my breakout book. It's the one that, you know, just took my career to a whole new place. And what's different about that book is that it I changed what I had been writing. We were talking about this a little bit before, yes. before we went live. So um, I had been writing science-based thrillers similar to what Michael Crichton writes. And I had modest success. They were, they were published by a major publisher, but in mass market paper size, paperback size, you know, the littler books, modest success. Then I started um, in the, I actually woke up in the night with the first sentences of the Marsh King's daughter fully formed in my head. Wow. <laughs> and, yeah. So, and that took me, took my writing off in another direction. It took me into the area of psychological suspense. And I discovered in the process of writing The Marsh King's Daughter that that's what I should have been writing all along. Um, it played to my strengths. Um, and in order to tell the story, I had to try a lot of writing techniques that I had not used before. Like The Marsh King's Daughter is told in a past and present with 
a single character. The Wicked Sister is also told in past and present. Rachel, who I'm introduced in the, the present day, and then we have her mother telling her story in the past, which is interesting because the reader knows from the first page that the mother is dead. <laughs> so, but you know, so the story in the past, even though it's told in first person, walks the reader up to what happened. You know, it answers those questions for the reader. So I think, you know, what the big change for me in shifting genres or subgenres, if you want to call it that, from environmental thrillers to psychological suspense is what made all the difference in my writing career because um, I found out, like I said, I was, I was good at it. <laughs> and so this is what I'm writing going forward. Oh my gosh, absolutely. I want to hear more about this. First, I just want to welcome all of our friends on Facebook. Welcome our mystery community, our mystery fam. Um, tell us where you're watching from today. We love to know where you're logging on from. And any questions you have for Karen, this is your time. This is what we love to do here at A Mighty Blaze is give you access, unprecedented access to this incredible author. So ask her anything you like about her writing, her book, her process. Um, and while just type them on the chat box, I'll get them right over to her. Um, and while people are typing and thinking, Karen, tell us a little more about the switch. So you were writing environmental thrillers and now you're writing psychological thrillers. Could you just make sure we understand the difference between those two things? Yeah. And maybe this will help too. So when I was writing the environmental thrillers, I always started with the plot, um, hopefully an interesting and engaging plot, but plot came first. And then I created characters that serve the plot. So when I started writing The Marsh King's Daughter, I woke up in the night with the first sentences of the novel fully formed in my head. And the sentences are, if I told you my mother's name, you'd recognize it right away. My mother was famous, though she never wanted to be. Hers wasn't the kind of fame anyone would wish for. Amanda Berry, J. Sue DeGard, Elizabeth Smart, that kind of fame, though my mother was none of them. Ooh. All of that was just in my head. <laughs> and in the middle of the night, it looked like a good idea because I thought to myself, well, this is interesting. So this character is the daughter of a kidnapped girl and the man who took her. So the next morning I wrote a few more paragraphs in her voice, which is now the first page of the novel, which is, is of course very cool. And the thing about it was as, as I, as the days went by, I kept writing little snippets in Helena's voice, exploring different things about her character. And I realized I, I have to write this character's story, but I didn't even know what the story was going to be. So that's how it was so different than my other books. My books started, they were plot heavy. And this time I started with a character and then found a story for the character. And because The Marsh King's Daughter deals almost exclusively, it's all about her relationship with her father. Because in this book, for the first 12 years of her life, Helena lives in an isolated cabin in Michigan's Upper Peninsula Wilderness with her mother and father, and she never sees anyone except her mother and father, which might sound grim, but she loves her life. It's all she knows. She's a little tomboy. She likes hunting and fishing and foraging. She finds out when she's 12 the true circumstances that her father had kidnapped her mother, and she's the product of that crime. And then so that's the story in the past. The story in the present, she's a young mother of two little girls. She's still living in the Upper Peninsula, um, but her husband doesn't know her history because there was a lot of notoriety when she and her mother came out of the marsh and she just wanted to put all that behind her and have a quiet life. Her father has been living in a maximum security prison not far from her home. He escapes during a prison transfer and disappears oh into like the marsh or the swamp. So in the, in the present day half of the story, Helena has to use the hunting and tracking skills that he taught her as a little child to find him before he can find her. And so the two parts of the stories are interwoven. So that's what makes it psychological suspense, you know, because it, it just narrows in on this twisted yet not twisted relationship because Helena loves her father when she's little. And then, and then when she leaves the marsh, she hates him because of all the things that she doesn't know about the outside world, she feels like a fool. Then when she, she's 18, she puts all that behind her. She re reinvents herself. So she, in effect, denies her father. And then by the end of the book, you know, she has to come to terms with who and what she is. So 
those are the kind of things that I love exploring in my fiction. And The Wicked Sister does that too. Obviously, Rachel has a sister because of the title of the book, you know, and so that book focuses on their relationship, which I'll admit is a little twisted because that's what I write. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. I'm still sitting here just uh, spellbound um, at this intricately woven um, plot. And also, I mean, so many questions. And I know our audience has a lot of questions too. Um, and I want to be sure to get to those. But well, I need to know so much about this. So first of all, when you were making the switch from the environmental thrillers to the psychological thrillers, you said, you know, that you had intricately plotted them, that it was plot driven for the environmentals. Then you woke up in the middle of the, ni of the night with these, the first lines of the book, which remain the first lines of the book, you wrote them down, then you got up the next morning and kept writing them. Um, it sounds like that's a faith led process. You went from plotting, which is sort of more of a scientific, you know, um, to, to this, you know, I mean, where do you think those words came from? Yeah, that's a real, real question, isn't it? You know, it, it truly was inspired. And the thing is too, um, at the time, I was looking for a backstory for a character for another novel I planned to write. So my subconscious was looking for a character who had a story to tell, right? You know, and so that works on you while you're asleep. Yes. And then um, the other piece of this particular story that I didn't mention yet was, so I woke up in the night with a character, wrote a few paragraphs the next day. That morning, I almost gave the book an urban setting because I was thinking about the young women in Cleveland, Ohio, who were, you know, hidden in plain sight for so long. Yes. But I thought, well, maybe that's a little obvious. So I set the book where I did in a cabin on a ridge surrounded by marsh or swamp in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. And the reason I set the book there is because I lived there. Um, my husband and I lived for 30 years in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, beginning in the 1970s when we homesteaded on a little piece of property. So we didn't live entirely off the grid like Helena's family does, but I drew heavily on my own experience when I wrote the book. Mm. But, but back to the idea of process. So when it came time to come up with a story for this character, you know, what was going to happen to her in the book, I had no idea. I got my childhood books of fairy tales off the shelf and I started paging through them to see if there was a fairy tale that I could use to structure the story. And the reason I did that was because I was familiar with a few novels, in particular, A.O. and Ivy's The Snow Child, beautiful book set in 1920s Alaska, parallels the fairy tale, The Snow Child. I, I highly recommend it. And so when I found the fairy tale, The Marsh King's Daughter, the parallels were just astonishing. So I knew that I had found, you know, this special story that I wanted to tell. Wow. I don't think I knew that there were marshes in Michigan. I think of that as a Louisiana, Florida, Southern, swampy right. kind of thing. I don't, I, I, I've never been to Michigan, but I, I didn't realize there were marshes and swampland yes we'd probably call it wetlands you wetlands. know I ended up calling it marsh because the marsh king's daughter fairy tale I would probably in my own language call it a swamp you know but uh yeah they're they're all over the earth yeah mm. and so as I was writing uh the marsh king's daughter when I wrote the first chapter I was I was very far outside my comfort zone I was trying a kind of writing that I had never tried before you know didn't entirely know where the story was going I really wasn't sure if it was even going to be a thriller because I just wanted to tell this character's story it, it intrigued me mm. so um, I wrote the first chapter um, I tried a lot of writing techniques that I had never used before like directly addressing the reader if I told you my mother's name you'd recognize it right away I'd never written like that before and other things too. So I sent the chapter off to my agent, not sure if, if it was even on point. <laughs> and he, of course he liked it, but he told me very much later, it was so good. He didn't think I had written it. <laughs> oh my, oh my I gosh. Just, I just love because it just shows what a big step up the writing was for me, you know? And, and yet at the same time, the lesson that I take away from that is had I just stuck with writing environmental thrillers, which were maybe easier or simpler to write, I wouldn't have known what I was capable of doing. So that's my big piece of advice to writers is, is if you're not 
having those results that you want. Like maybe you're querying an agent and you're not getting through, or you know, you've written a few books and you're with a smaller publisher and you'd like to step up to a bigger publisher. Don't be afraid to change what you're doing because just because you start writing in a particular subgenre doesn't mean that that's where your strengths lie. Wow, that is fascinating. That is so, that is such an interesting perspective. And I love the idea of just trying new things and being resourceful and switching it up. Um, yeah. That is, and it, and through this process, you have found and flourished um, in, in where you were clearly meant to be, which yeah. is amazing. So do, I have to know, do you keep a notebook beside your bed now? Do you have more divine ideas flowing? <laughs> I'm too lazy to do that, but I do get up in the middle of the night and write things down if I have to. Yes. <laughs> So the ideas still keep coming. Yeah, they do. They do. Wow. You know, I actually, you, and you had said that, that you had gone to bed thinking about trying to create this character for your other book mm. and, um, and that your subconscious was working on it. And that is so fascinating to me because um, I, I actually had read that that, that, is, that that is true, that when you, if you go to bed thinking about something, even in your sleep state, your brain is still processing information. It's still trying to solve the puzzle that you've given it. So if you want to work through something, write yeah. it down or be thinking about it as you're going to bed and let it marinate <laughs> overnight. So do you still do that? Well, yeah, and it's it's so amazing too because again, back to that story, the Marsh King's daughter. Why did I get my book of fairy tales off the shelf? I would have read that fairy tale when I was a child, you see. So it was it was in there too somewhere. So you know, the creative process is just so cool when it works well. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So Karen, what are you working on now? Are you are you brainstorming? Are you writing? Or what are you? Where are you in your creative process? I am writing, you know, as I was working on The Wicked Sister, it was a challenging book for me to write because it was my follow up to The Marsh King's Daughter and The Marsh King's Daughter got a lot of acclaim. It, it, uh, we sold translation rights in 25 languages around the world Amazing. and, you know, it was a bestseller in um, Germany and Sweden and Iceland and it got wonderful reviews. It was, it was reviewed in the New York Times and it was a rave review. So, you know, as an author, that was my kill me now moment. It can't get any better than this. So That's the dream. of course I was, I was happy as all these wonderful things were happening for the book, but at the same time, creatively, it was intimidating, you know, because you're thinking, oh my, <laughs> I have to do this again, oh. you know? And like I said, because the Marsh King's daughter was a big step up for me. So, um, writing the wicked sister was not easy <laughs> and wow. i've heard writers say sometimes they're most proud of the book that they worked the hardest on so i i have to say i've i've learned what that is like with the wicked sister and so um it, i wasn't to to your point of what am i working on now so it was the wicked sister was so hard when i was done with it and my editor accepted it i had every intention of taking some time off right I got an idea for the next book. In the middle of the night? Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know if it was night or day or what, but I was just like, oh my goodness, here we go again. So yes, I am working on another psychological suspense that's also set in Michigan's Upper Peninsula because I know that area so well and it's just such an intriguing place to set the novels that I do because in, in my novel, psychological suspense, the adversaries aren't always family members. Sometimes it's like a stranger next door or a stranger takes over the house of, of a family or something like that. Mine, I like exploring where the protagonist and the antagonist are family members. You know, mm. it was father daughter in The Marsh King's Daughter, it's sisters in The Wicked Sister. And so by setting my these same books in an isolated setting, it's like I get rid of all the extraneous characters, right? <laughs> you know, and bring it down just to what's happening in the in that little family. Oh, that's so interesting. And plus, it's something we can all relate to because we all have families, whatever they may look like. There's always intra-family politics and dynamics, etc. So, um, and we're getting thumbs up from the audience on that. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, and so that's such a fascinating thing. And also there's something so interesting and sort of exotic about this marshland that I think, you know, many of us have not been to. So that's really, 
really cool. Um, and apparently maybe there's some sort of big creative <laughs> um, vortex there that we all need to head to the marshland and, and plug in to <laughs> this so. Karen, D you, maybe lead, uh, you know, creativity <laughs> retreats. I think we all need to take a Karen Dion uh, creativity yep. retreat there. That sounds fantastic. Mystery writing, thriller writing retreat. Um, that would be awesome. So what's your practice look like um, when you're not waking up in the middle of the night and you're know, struck by divine inspiration? Do you rise with the sun, go to your desk? Do you keep banker's hours? Do you just flow when the creativity flows? Do you, are you clawing for every word? I mean, what's it, what's it like to, to be in your process? Yeah, well, you know, I have to say, I am one of the fortunate few writers who now makes my living from writing, which Yay. is like a, the sweet spot, right? You know, it only took 20 years, but here I am. <laughs> and so I'm a natural early riser. So my best writing time creatively is from about 6 a.m. till noon. And so, you know, that's where I'm, I'm getting the fresh ideas. Everything's going really well. Um, on an ideal day, then I would take most of the afternoon off, you know, and do other things, move around. You have to get out from behind the computer, right? And, and then uh, I like to come back to work after supper because I get another burst of creativity in the early evening. Oh, and cool. so, um, yeah, and so in that in-between time, if I'm working, writing all day, what I'm writing in the afternoon, I know isn't as good, but at least I'm getting some words down. You know, there's always that. And then when I look at those words the next morning, I'm like, oh, well, this, 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 and then off I go again. <laughs> so when do you, when you pick it back up in the early evening, what time do you usually work till then? Oh, like six to eight. So you're not a long session, but just enough to uh, take advantage of that boost. Must be I, I, uh, I've been fed, right? You know, <laughs> so I'm ready to go again. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you've refueled. Now you've yeah. got energy to go. That's fantastic. Um, and it's so good that you are aware of and able to utilize and sort of harness the power of when you are creatively most productive. Yeah, it's like I say, I, I know a lot of writers and because I used to organize writers conferences and, and I would talk to a lot of writers. And so, you know, I really feel for the writers who are, let's say, they're working and they're writing and they have a young family, you know, so they've got little children that have, you know, needs, right? You can't just pretend they don't exist. <laughs> and or, or, you know, maybe they have a day job or they're, they have other responsibilities and they just are able to snatch only just a few hours here and there. And I really admire the people who are able to do that, who are able to, you know, sit down, be creative and then go off and do the things that they have to do. Uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it is about finding what works best for you. And, and, but again, I think knowing yourself and not trying to, you know, conform, conform yourself to something that doesn't really resonate with you because that's what you've been told or, you know, or that, or, or that's what you have this idea that you should be doing. Right, right. And for me, another part of my process was something that I also discovered accidentally. And that is that I write my first drafts by longhand in and the reason I, I started doing that was um, I, I was uh, writing a novel, the one before The Marsh King's Daughter was what's called a work for hire. So I was writing a novel based on a television show using the show's characters, my original story. And it had a very, very compressed time in which to write the book. And then that got delayed because it was involved with television and there were a lot of people making decisions. When I, when I agreed to write the book, I thought I had that window of time. By the time I was actually writing it, the window had gotten even shorter. And not only that, I live in the Detroit area. My daughter was getting married in Boston and I had to be working every minute I could. So my laptop was too big to use on the plane. I brought a notepad and I discovered that writing longhand is so much more productive than writing on the computer. At least it is for me. And I've since talked to other uh, authors who agree because, and there's a few reasons for that. When you're writing in longhand, you don't make a typo for one thing. You know, <laughs> if you make a typo on the screen, it interrupts your thought process because you see the typo and you stop and you correct it because why wouldn't you? It's, it's going to need to be corrected at some point anyway. Mm. And then the other thing is I have terrible handwriting, just atrocious handwriting. So I had to force myself to slow down even more if I was going to be able to read what I had written. That's no joke. <laughs> and so 
my productivity is so so you give more careful thought to what you're putting down on the page. So word count went from 2500 words a week to three to 5000 words a day. What? Yes. Wow. Even yes. though you're writing by right. hand. Wow. That's right. amazing. It was amazing. I wrote 3000 words the morning of my daughter's wedding. <laughs> <laughs> So, so whenever possible, that's now what I do, you know, because um, again, on the computer, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist, I'm a tweaker and, you know, you'll move this paragraph around and play around with it. And that's just all time that you don't need to be putting into it if you're writing by hand. Yeah. Wow. We're getting a lot of wows from the, from the audience. I think we're all <laughs> astounded. That's incredible. Three to 5,000 words a day is itself astounding. In longhand, yeah. my God, woman, who are you? Yeah. You're this divine creature. It's not hard. You know, you get into the zone and you're writing. And what I would like to do, what I did was as soon as I finished a chapter, I would type it into the computer because I like to see the progress. I like to see the word count. And then I would give it just a light edit and, you know, then go on to the next um, writing by hand. And so I wrote that novel in like nine weeks. It was pretty crazy. Oh my God, that's amazing. I didn't think I could be more astounded yet here I am. <laughs> Karen, that's yeah. incredible. Oh my gosh, yeah. I, am in, I am in awe. Allow me to genuflect at your creative feet because that is, yeah. wow. Well, wow. that's not my, that's not my usual pace. I mean, it still takes a year to write a novel as the Marsh King's daughter did. And the Wicked Sister took even more because I, I started over many times, but uh, yeah, the, that was my first experience with writing the first draft by longhand. And it was really productive. Actually, I have two friends who write by longhand, both men. I thought they were crazy. And now, now I know, I think maybe they're onto something, but actually um, retired NYPD detective, um, Jason Allison, who's querying his first thriller, um, wrote it by longhand. Um, and, and my friend Brian Larrabee also wrote his, um, not a mystery, but his generational saga, multi-generational saga, um, historical fiction, um, wrote his. So you guys must be onto something <laughs> because clearly it's working for you. That's amazing. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So those uh, accidental discoveries, they're really good. <laughs> they are really good. So Karen, what's one thing you want us to take from your book, The Wicked Sister, when we read it? What's one thing you want readers to really take from that book? Yeah, so so there are some some heavy themes in the book, but yeah. um, I want people to think, so, so for instance, Rachel, the main character, she believes that she accidentally shot and killed her mother when she was a child. <sighs> and that was inspired by a real life account I read about a toddler who was sitting behind his mother in a car, in his car seat, he's a toddler, right? And he finds a loaded handgun in his mother's purse and shoots and kills her. Oh, yeah. God. Is, I know, I know, it just- This is why I'm of. against guns. <laughs> yes. Ugh. And so, you know, at some point that, that just always stuck with me. And, you know, at some point that little boy is gonna know what he did, you know, he's gonna find out. And then how would that change, you know, your perception of yourself? You know, that's a part of your history, who right. you are, that you weren't aware of for a long time and, and, you know, the terrible guilt that you would feel. So that's one half that I wanted to explore with Rachel. And then um, the other half of the book is told from the perspective of her mother. And I, I mentioned that Rachel has a sister. Well, Rachel's sister is quite damaged you know she's yeah, she's yeah. not a, a good little girl she's a she's a very difficult child and that was inspired again by something from real life a family that we knew um years ago adopted three siblings and the two younger children did really well in the new environment but the older child just did not he was difficult to handle he was violent towards his little brother and sister mm -hmm. eventually you know after trying everything they had to put him in an institution when he was about 12. And again, you know, the tragedy of that just struck a chord with me because how do you, how do you reach that point? How do you know that you can't do anything more for the child? And the best thing for the child and the family is to put him in an institution, you know, where he can get help, but is also removed from the family circle. Yeah. And so that's the situation that Jenny Rachel's mother has to face 
in the other half of the wicked sister. So what I want people to take away from that, I guess, is to, you know, ha think, think about what it is like for someone that is struggling with a difficult child, let's say, you know, maybe, maybe you're at the store and you see a child throwing a tam temper tantrum on the floor, you know, stop and think that maybe this child has got some issues that you're not aware of. It's not necessarily an example of bad parenting. Maybe that parent is doing everything they can for that child. And this is, this is the best that they get, you know? So that's the kind of thing that I want people to take away from the wicked sister. Just, just think about your own relationships, um, your own relationships with your sisters. And um, of course, hopefully it's an entertaining story in the meanwhile. <laughs> well, as a woman with two sisters, um, <laughs> that definitely resonates. Clearly I'm the good one. Um, but no, there are all you good. the middle sister by any chance? I'm the oldest sister. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's why I I'm think the I'm the best. <laughs> Um, no, but I think we can all relate to that. So that's, that's amazing. Um, Karen, what, who's a one reader you're dying to meet? Who's, who do you look up to? Who do you admire? Whose writing do you, do you think is fantastic? Oh, you know, um, I, I would like to meet A.O. and Ivy. I would like to meet, and this might sound a little funny, but when I read for pleasure, I read outside my genre. Ooh. Um, I read a lot in my genre. And of course I enjoy those books, but um, just when, if I'm going to pull a book off the shelf, it's going to be like a national book award winner or Booker prize winner or nominee, because I, I want to read really beautiful writing, really good quality writing. I find it inspiring. Mm. So I guess I'd like to meet Colson Whitehead. Oh, I don't Colson know Whitehead. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh. Yes. Winning that second. Um, yes. Uh, my God, that man is <laughs> yeah. a genius. Yes, Pulitzer, absolutely. Right? It was a Pulitzer, I believe. Yeah, two. Yes. I know. Incredible. I, know. Mm -hmm. I didn't even know it was possible to win two. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. Th that, I think that's a really, really good choice. And, and I love that he's tackling such incredibly difficult, painful topics. That's right. That's um, right. Talk about making people think. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was your favorite childhood book? Oh, I loved the boxcar children. Oh, I don't know that one. That's before your time. But that was about a family that um, the kids were orphans. There were maybe six kids and they found an old boxcar in the woods. And, you know, rather than be split up in an orphanage or whatever was was facing them, they, they managed on their own in the woods, you know, learned how to build fires and I don't know what all, but that's what really appealed to me. And I think it's so funny because, you know, that's sort of the life that I lived when my husband and I homesteaded in the Upper Peninsula. And it's sort of the books I'm writing now <laughs> set in the forest or the woods. So those early books can really have an effect on us, can't they? Absolutely. Absolutely. Oh my gosh. Well, Karen, this has been amazing to chat with you. We are so happy to celebrate your brand new gorgeous book, The Wicked Sister, out today. Everyone, my partner in crime is posting the link to our special partnership with bookshop.org so you can support independent bookstores and get Karen's gorgeous new book. Um, so, uh, be sure to pick up your copy now, Karen, you are amazing. And, um, and thank you for sharing your process. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, um, and all that you've learned along the way. This has been such an enriching, illuminating, heart filling experience to chat with you today. Um, and congratulations on this book. I hope that we will see you back right here at a mighty blaze with the next one. Thank you so much for having me. And I hope people who come away from this interview feeling inspired. Um, just if you're a writer, go for it. <laughs> and I if you're a reader, it. enjoy the book. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. We absolutely love that. We're getting hearts up from the audience. Thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Kelly, for the hearts. Um, and have a great day, everybody. We'll see you right here back on a Mighty Blaze, Mighty Mysteries next time. Have a great day.